I will have uh, I will have one eye on the on the chat, and I will try to answer your questions as as we um, as we progress. And one last thing, I am working on two screens in parallel. It's easier for me to handle all the technology. So you might see me looking to the side. It's not because I'm not with you. I'm completely with you. I'm just checking that the PowerPoint is running OK on the other uh, screen, OK? So I think we're going <clears> to <throat> go ahead and start. And I'm going to share with you <clears throat> my screen, sorry. OK, uh, can you see the slides OK? Yeah, great, OK. So as I said, our topic today, or as Noam said, our topic today uh, is the connection between the, the brain and the body, or as I like to call this talk, the brain-mind-body uh, connections. But as I said, first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and the, the place where I work today. So as Noam said, I, uh, I have a PhD in neuroscience, which I completed in 2015 at the Tel Aviv University in Israel. And when I finished my PhD, um, I had an understanding that although I like research and I believe, of course, in research and science, I, I think that science is the best way we have today of asking questions about the world and about ourselves and getting answers, qualified answers. Uh, and although I really believe in science, obviously I'm a scientist, uh, it was obvious to me that I did not want sort of a academic career. So, you know, finishing my PhD, going abroad, doing a postdoc, coming back to Israel, opening a lab, uh, guiding students and so on. I understood that this is not what I wanted to do. And I, um, found out about, about myself during my PhD that one of the things that I enjoy most is talking to people about the brain and uh, taking complex uh, scientific knowledge from neuroscience and turning it into something accessible and helping people understand why this scientific knowledge is relevant to their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and this is what I wanted uh, to do. And so I came to work at the Sagol Center for Brain and Mind, which is a neuroscience research center at Reichman University, also in Israel. And we do three uh, main things. The first thing is brain research. Of course, we have a lab and people come to our lab and we connect them to EEG and we put them inside the MRI and uh, we ask questions about their brains and we try to understand the connection between brain function and human behavior and psychology. And specifically, we are looking at uh, well-being and we are asking what can we do on a daily basis to support uh, neuro, uh, neuronal networks in our brain that make us more resilient, that make us better at managing stress, at regulating emotions, at training our attentional uh, abilities. Uh, so we are looking at all kinds of uh, mental and brain exercises that are supposed to do this, this thing. And one of the things that we are looking at uh, most closely is uh, mindfulness meditation. I'm quite sure that most of you at least have heard the concept of mindfulness meditation. It has become a serious buzzword. Um, a serious buzzword in, 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 in latest times. So we are looking at the mindfulness meditation as a tool to train our brain uh, and support our well-being. And I will talk a little bit about it because mindfulness meditation is very connected uh, to the body. Um, so this is what uh, actually the lab uh, does. But as I said, I'm today not involved in research. I am today involved in our educational uh, efforts. We have a program called the Purple School Program. And in this program, we work with uh, schools and we try uh, to bring into the schools the knowledge from neuroscience and work, to work together with the teachers and ask, what does this knowledge from neuroscience tell me about how I, as a teacher, need to manage my class? 
what kind of pedagogical practices should I use in the class to support the brain development and the psychological developments um, of my pupils. And we bring into the schools, as I said, knowledge from neuroscience, coupled with mindfulness training, both for teachers and for pupils, and also uh, the field which is called social emotional learning, again, which has become very popular in recent years. And uh, social emotional learning, again, is, it's, it's a group of practices aimed at developing the social and emotional world of pupils. And we are working with the teachers um, to bring this into the school from an understanding that school is not only a place where you acquire uh, formal knowledge, it's a place that is supposed to support your development and help you learn about yourself and ask yourself, who am I? What is important to me? What kind of person do I want to be when I grow up? So this is something that we're trying to bring uh, into the schools and, and happily they embrace it because teachers today feel that, again, the, their, their, their main job is not just to give knowledge. You want knowledge, you go to Wikipedia, you go to Google, you don't necessarily need a teacher standing in a classroom. But if the teacher can support you in developing as a person, then this is probably one of the most important things that, that you can get in the educational system. And I'm part of this uh, program. I bring the neuroscience knowledge uh, into the schools. And the last thing that we do is general uh, knowledge dissemination, not only working with the educational system in Israel, we also work with people from the mental health uh, area. So psychologists, psychiatrists, anyone, uh, who is related to mental to mental health and also the the general uh, the general public, uh, kind of like what the synapse uh, is trying to do here. Um, okay, so this is a little bit about me and about the Sagol Center, and as we are going to talk today about the connections between the brain and the mind and the body, I want us to start off uh, with a little exercise, a really short exercise to help us uh, connect for a moment to our bodies and to what they need at the moment. So I'm gonna activate a timer for three minutes. But before I activate this timer, I want to ask you to uh, close your eyes for a minute, okay? And, and this part, I don't mind if you turn off the camera. I know sometimes it's, it's, it's easier to close your eyes when your camera is closed, so you can turn off your cameras. Close your eyes and bring your attention to your body and ask yourself, uh, what is my body telling me that I need at the moment in order for me to be able to be completely present during this talk? So is my body telling me that I am a little bit thirsty, a little bit hungry, maybe I'm cold, maybe I'm hot, Maybe the chair is not so comfortable and I would like to sit on another chair. Um, maybe there's some tension somewhere in my body. So, so take a minute and, and try to see what your body is telling you. And now I'm going to start the timer for three minutes. And I want you to take these three minutes to try to do something to make yourselves more comfortable. Okay, so if you're hungry, go get a little something to eat. If you're thirsty, go get a little something to drink. If your chair is a little bit uncomfortable, maybe try switching chairs. If there's some kind of tension in your body, try to sort of relax it. And at the end of these three minutes, I would be happy if you could write in the chat what you found out from your body and were you able to sort of fix it okay so three minutes you have three minutes to take care of your body to help yourself be completely present without things stealing your attention away um, and at the end of these three minutes i will call you back and i will ask you what was your body telling you
Okay, so um, our three minutes are up. Uh, and I would be happy if you could write to me in the chat, as I said, uh, what was your body telling you and were you able to do something uh, to make yourselves more comfortable for this talk? So people are writing me, I realized I was too hot. Uh, I was sitting funny in the chair and I readjusted my body. Um, my body was telling me that I was hungry. So I grabbed some chips and dip, always a good option when you're hungry. Um, to breathe and embrace the opportunity to rest. Um, I needed movement. Uh, my body was asking me to brush my teeth. I know that feeling. Um, Noam is writing that she was hungry. Um, took some sips of water and took breath, changed my chair and took water with me. Um, relaxed, closed my eyes as it's midnight here. Yeah, midnight is a difficult time to listen to a lecture. Um, put some stuff on my dry lips, uh, took some deep breath, helped me help my comfort level, um, and so on. So a lot of you indeed are writing about something to eat, something to drink, a little bit of breathing, some relaxation, adjusting myself um, in the chair. And this is actually a very good exercise. If there are any people here in the crowd who are teachers or instructors, this is actually an exercise that we recommend the, teacher, the teachers that we work with to, to start the day with. So when they go into class, before they start teaching, they give the children about four or five minutes to pay attention to their bodies, to learn to pay attention to their bodies and to ask themselves, what is my body telling me that I need at the moment in order to be more present in the lesson that I'm going to undergo. And these really simple actions of getting something to eat, getting something to drink, adjusting my position in the chair, noticing that maybe I'm a little bit too hot, a little bit too cold, that something is bothering me. Um, this is something very important uh, because again, it teaches the children, the pupils to connect to their bodies and they come to realize that our bodies are always giving us very precious information about our emotional uh, status, our cognitive status, our attentional status, status. And sadly, in many cases, we never stop to listen. So the body is telling me a lot of things, but I don't have time to listen. Uh, and so I miss a lot of things that I can use in order to bring myself to a place of well being to a place of attention, to a place of full presence. So also I like to start my lectures with this uh, uh, simple exercise and it's a good exercise to do uh, whenever. And again, we'll talk about it, of course, uh, more deeply. So um, I want to start you off with a, little, with a little research, not a little, it's a big research, but I'll talk about it um, uh, shortly. Uh, and this research was actually published on April 14th, so about a week ago. And this research actually showed uh, that people that have psychiatric disorders have a greater risk of developing COVID after being vaccinated. What is called a breakthrough infection. Breakthrough infection is when you get COVID even if you've been completely vaccinated. And the researchers here from the University of um, California in San Francisco wanted to see whether people that suffer from psychiatric disorder uh, were at a greater risk for this breakthrough infection. So they collected data from 250,000 Americans, which is a really big uh, database. And indeed, they found out that if you were suffering from uh, any mental disorder, your risk of uh, developing COVID, even if you are fully vaccinated, 
goes up by about 20%. This was especially uh, noticeable in the population of uh, older patients, people from um, 60 and above, but it was also present in the younger population. Um, and one of the explanations that the researchers gave here, which is a very plausible ex explanation, is that we know that people that suffer from uh, psychiatric disorders, in many cases, their immune system is weakened. So their immune system is much less efficient. And so when they get vaccinated, the vaccination is also uh, less efficient. And that means that they are more at risk to develop um, COVID. And I bring this study because this is just one of many millions of studies being published in the last few years showing that our mental state and our physical state are deeply connected. And in many cases, if your mental state is deteriorated because you have a psychiatric disorder or you suffer from high levels of stress, in these cases, your body will also be uh, deteriorated. You will be more at risk uh, to getting all kinds of infectious uh, diseases. Uh, you will be more sick than other people. Um, and this is interesting because uh, until maybe 30 or 40 years ago, there was not a lot of interest in the connections between the brain and the body and happily, this has shifted, and today we understand that these connections or understanding these connections is imperative uh, to understanding how we can support people's mental well being through looking at the connections between the brain and the body. So, here is the human brain, okay, about 86 billion uh, brain cells connecting to each other via synapses. Uh, this is one of the most complex systems that we know. Um, and the brain is a privileged organ. What do I mean when I say that the brain is a privileged organ? Uh, first of all, without the brain, the body, of course, cannot function. So if the brain goes, everything goes. Um, and because neurons can function in a very specific uh, chemical environment, the brain needs to um, regulate really strongly the chemical processes happening inside of itself. Um, and this is why uh, there are a lot of mechanisms which make sure that the chemical uh, environment in the brain uh, doesn't change because any little change can make the neurons uh, malfunction and that's a big problem. Now, one of these mechanisms is something called the blood-brain barrier. Maybe some of you have heard about uh, this mechanism. And this mechanism is a mechanism that uh, makes it difficult uh, for, sub for sub substances that are going around in our bodies to penetrate the brain. Now we know about this blood-brain barrier for many, many, many years. And the first person to show that this barrier actually exists is this researcher here. His name is Paul Ehrlich. He's not alive today, but he did um, many, many studies about this blood-brain barrier um, towards the end, middle end of the 19th uh, century. And one of his most famous experiment was an experiment that had two parts. In the first part, he took uh, an embryo of a guinea pig and he injected uh, the embryo with blue, special uh, blue dye into the bloodstream of the body. And he waited for a few days and then he checked what happened to this blue dye that he inserted to the body. And as you can see here, picture num pic the picture that's numbered A, uh, the blue dye spread all over this embryo's body, but it was not able to penetrate the brain and the spinal cord. The brain and the spinal cord stayed uh, white. They were unaffected by this blue dye. And then he did the second part of the experiment. Again, it took an embryo. This time, I think it was a pig embryo. And he injected the blue dye straight into the brain. And again, he waited a few days and then he looked at what happened to the dye and he was able to show that the dye spread all over the brain and the spinal cord, but was unable to pen penetrate um, 
other tissues in the body. So this was actually the first experiment that showed the existence of the blood brain barrier and that there is this kind of mechanism uh, whose job is to separate uh, circulation of material in the body from circulation of material in the brain. Today, we know that the blood brain barrier is actually the special composition of the blood vessels going into the brain. In the body, the blood vessels are very porous. They have big holes and chemical substances can go in and out of the blood vessels quite freely. And this is logical because the, the blood system is a transport system, which is supposed to help compounds get to different tissues in the body. But once these blood vessels go into the brain, they become much less porous. And there are all kinds of mechanisms making sure that stuff can just freely um, seep into the brain. Uh, and because we know about this blood brain, brain barrier for many years, it was thought that there is a complete separation between bodily systems and systems in the brain. So things happening in the body are unable to penetrate the brain, are unable to influence the brain. Um, and this paradigm, as I said, has shifted. And I would say like the, the last uh, death blow to this paradigm that there is a hard uh, separation between the body and the brain happened not, not so long ago in 2015, when a group of researchers were able to show that the immune system has special vessels penetrating from the body into the brain. What you see here on the right is the brain of a rat and the vessels which are marked in red are the vessels that were, they were discovered in 2012. And it was the first time that researchers were able to show that the immune system has vessels that connect directly from, from the brain to the body. Then in 2015, they were able to show that this is also true for the human brain. And on the left, you can see how they used to uh, paint the, um, vessels of the immune system. These are called the lymphatic vessels. And before 2015, we thought that the lymphatic vessels go all over the body and stop somewhere at the level of the neck and they can't penetrate into the brain. The brain has a separate immune system. And because of these uh, studies today, again, we understand that these lymphatic vessels go directly into the brain. And as I said, this was the, the final blow to this um, concept that there is a hard separation between the brain and the body. Uh, of course, there were many, many more studies, but this was one of the, one of the good ones, one of the, the strong ones. And when I read it, they, the, the scientists that published it said, we're sorry, but they're gonna have to change all the textbooks now for neuroscience students and psychology students because of this, uh, this finding, it was a very robust and special finding. And today, uh, as I said, there is a paradigm shift uh, when we talk about the brain-body connections. So in the past, if you would ask a neuroscientist, can you tell us a little bit about the relationship between the brain and the body? The neuroscientist would say, of course, the brain is the general manager. The brain controls the body, the brain controls all bodily functions but this is a one-way street. So the brain can regulate the body, but the body is quite passive. It cannot uh, regulate the brain. Today, of course, we understand that this is completely a two-way street. And as the brain regulates the body, the body also regulates the brain through a lot of um, connecting uh, mechanisms, which we will talk about, of course. Uh, and we are talking today about what is called the embodied brain approach. And the, the embodied brain approach actually says that our bodies and bodily processes influence the way we perceive the world and ourselves, learn about the world and ourselves, experience the world and ourselves, make sense of the world and ourselves, um, and so on and so forth. And what I'm actually saying is that our um, human experience, the way that our cognition works, the way that our emotions work, the way that we interact socially, 
all these processes are directly influenced by uh, bodily processes, bodily functions, bodily uh, systems. And again, we will see a few examples um, during the talk. Um, we talk today about, uh, I would say, five major highways connecting the body and the brain. So I will give you a nice list of all these highways. Um, first of all, the endocrine system or the hormonal system. Uh, this is a system that secretes various hormones inside our bodies. Um, cortisol, adrenaline, testosterone, estrogen, uh, insulin, and many, many more oxytocin, many, many more hormones. And we know today that most of these hormones penetrate into the brain quite easily. And when they, when they penetrate into the brain, they act as neurotransmitters. They can connect to neurons. They can influence things happening in our synapses. And there is a very tight connection between our hormonal status and our emotional status. And in fact, we know today that in many psychiatric disorders, we can see hormonal um, imbalances. Um, so the endocrine system is very important for the way that our brains um, function. The second system is the immune system. And this goes back to the study, which I showed you in the beginning with the psychiatric patients and, and COVID infections. So we know today that the immune system talks to the brain on a regular basis um, and changes in our bodily immune system will directly affect things happening in our brain. Again, the immune system secretes a lot of proteins and other compounds that can penetrate the brain very easily um, and influence uh, its, fu its function. And as, as I said about hormones here also, we know that today in a lot of psychiatric disorders, we see impaired immune function. And we are even talking about the fact that maybe some of these psychiatric disorders do not start in the brain. They actually start with a malfunction of the immune system, which causes the brain to deteriorate. And then we have this psychiatric disorder um, that comes to light. Okay, so this is uh, very interesting. And finally, and this is like the most intriguing system because it's the newest one that was identified, our gut microbiota. I don't know if you know, but uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, it was shown that the composition of the uh, germs that are living in our gut can directly influence brain function and thus influence cognition, emotion, social functioning, and many, many more uh, things. We still don't know a lot about how this works. And this has been uh, a research, uh, research now uh, quite vigorously. So here we see three bodily systems, again, directly connecting um, the body to the brain. And as I said, we know that little changes to these systems can influence uh, changes inside the brain and thus influence our behavior, cognition, emotion, and so on and so forth. Um, there are two more systems or connections that I want to talk about, and I will delve more deeply into these systems because, because I think they get a little less attention. Uh, the first one is our motor system, uh, our ability to move, and what is called proprioception. I, I will explain in a minute what proprioception is. And the second one, this, is, this has been getting a lot of uh, research attention in recent years, is what we call interoception or the information flowing from our internal organs into our brain. And apparently this information is super important for our uh, emotional uh, function. So I will de delve a little deeply into these, uh, into these systems. And I will start with the motor system and uh, movement and proprioception. First of all, the importance of uh, movement. Now, me as a neuroscientist, when I give lectures, usually at the end of the lecture, someone will come over and ask me the million dollar question, uh, what can I do to keep my brain young and healthy? And then they will talk to me about magic pills that they found on Google 
or all kinds of um, weird treatments like sitting in oxygen chambers and so on and so forth. Um, and then I will ask them, before you go to sit in oxygen chambers and before you order all kinds of dubious magic pills off of Google, uh, do you exercise regularly? And in a lot of cases, the person will say no. He will be a little bit embarrassed and he will say no. Uh, and I will tell him before you try anything else, the first thing you need to do to keep your brain young and healthy is physical exercise. And there is a vast body of research, very strong uh, research showing that one of the most uh, or one of the best ways to keep our brains healthy, and, that, and of course, when our brains are healthy, our minds are healthy and our bodies are healthy. So one of the most efficient ways to do it is to exercise on a regular basis. And here I want to focus on aerobic exercise because most of the studies look at aerobic exercise. And I want to give you an example of a study. Um, th this study is not new. It was published in 2011, so about 11 years ago. But it's a very, uh, it's a very good study. Um, and, and, and again, there are many, many more uh, like him. And this study wanted to see if aerobic exercise can help people make their memory better. And this is, of course, uh, relating to the fact that the population in the world is getting older. And as we get older, we see more and more instances of Alzheimer and different kinds of dementias. And one of the most important questions to today is how can we help people get older without losing uh, cognitive function. And this is one of the reasons that there is so much interest in, in exercise because exercise has been shown to help us keep our cognitive abilities uh, nice and fresh. So what they actually did in this study, they took uh, people, uh, older people, people that were about 60 or 65 years old, and they put them into a program of physical exercises, physical exercise that lasted for a year, for 12 months. And they had two groups. One group did aerobic exercise, and the other group did uh, exercise of um, stretching and building your um, um, suppleness. Flexibility. Flexibility. Yeah, so stretching and flexibility, which is also important at older ages because it helps you be more coordinated and more balanced, and it lowers the risk of uh, falling. And we know that a lot of older people uh, fall and so on. But they wanted to see specifically whether the aerobic exercise will have a special effect on memory. So they took these two groups, one group a year of aerobic exercise, one group a year of strict stretching and flexibility. And during this intervention, they put these people into the MRI machine and they did an imaging of an area in the brain called the hippocampus. Uh, why the hippocampus? Because the hippocampus is the structure that helps us create long-term memories. And in people that suffer from Alzheimer's, this is one of the first brain areas that starts to deteriorate. And this is why in Alzheimer, the first symptoms will be loss of memory and an inability to create uh, new memories. And we want to see that the hippocampus stays nice and big and healthy. So you can see they were tested at three time points at baseline, which was the beginning of the intervention. Six months was the middle of the intervention and one year was at the end of the intervention. The blue line represents the aerobic group. The red line represents the flexibility group. And you can see very clearly that the people that did aerobic exercise, their hippocampus got bigger. What we see, the line represents the size of the hippocampus. While the people, the people that did the stretching and flexibility, their hippocampus was getting smaller. Now, our brains do shrink as we age. And when we look at brains of older people, we do expect over time to see the brains uh, getting smaller. But what we can see here that this program of aerobic exercise was able not only to maintain the size of the hippocampus, but also to help it uh, get bigger. 
which means that I will say this cautiously, but this is sort of an anti-aging effect. I don't like the concept of anti-aging because there is no anti-aging. We age, it's a fact of life and it's a fact of life that we have to embrace currently at least, and it's okay. It's, it's part of the circle of life, uh, but there are things we can do to slow down the aging process in the brain. And one of the things we can do, as you see here, is um, aerobic exercise, which helps maintain our hippocampus uh, big and healthy. Now, they looked at uh, all kinds of interesting uh, correlations, which I will show you. Um, the first correlation, don't mind the graphs. The graphs are just to, to show you how serious this study was, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you what they mean. Uh, so the first graph shows that the fitter you are, the bigger your hippocampus is. So there is a direct connection between your fitness and the size of your hippocampus. And again, this was an intervention. So we can carefully say that because these people got fitter and fitter along the intervention, this probably caused their hippocampus to become bigger. The second correlation shows that the more BDNF you have, the bigger your hippocampus is. And here I will explain. BDNF is a protein secreted in our brains. And I like to say that BDNF in the brain is kind of like fertilizer for neurons. So when neurons um, are exposed to BDNF, it helps them live longer, it helps them function better. And actually, as I said, one of the signs of a deteriorating brain is a decrease in the levels of BDNF. And one of the signs of a healthy brain is an increase in BDNF. And again, here we can see that people that were in the aerobic intervention, they had more BDNF. And this explains why their hippocampus got bigger because their neurons were actually flourishing and developing. The third correlation is the most interesting because we want to see that here we also have a functional result. So, okay, their hippocampus got bigger and they had more BDNF, but did this, does this have any meaning on their day-to-day -day lives? So the third correlation they found was that the bigger your hippocampus is, the better your memory performance is. Is all these people got memory, memory tests at the end of the intervention. And it was shown, first of all, that the people in the aerobics group had superior memory and the quality of the memory was directly related to the um, size of their hippocampus. Um, now, I have to say that this intervention was an intervention of moderate physical activity, okay? This was a sensible intervention. They didn't take these people and have them run a marathon or do a Ironman triathlon. It was a moderate uh, program, about three times a week, 45 minutes of aerobic exercise, uh, walking, maybe a little bit of running, a little bit of swimming, something that all of us can incorporate into our daily lives. And look at the effects. I mean, what more can I say? You don't need magic pills. You don't need to sit in oxygen chambers. You need to do aerobic exercise. And there is no uh, age in which it is too late to start. Even if you're 60 or 70 or 80, you can start. Of course, you need to do it carefully according to your physical um, situation, but it's always, uh, it's always there for you. Uh, so I do encourage you to incorporate it into your lives. Now here, I'm only showing you the effects on memory, but we know today that aerobic exercise has also effects on our emotional functioning. Aerobic exercise uh, help us, helps us to uh, support um, uh, positive feelings, helps us to lower our levels of stress, uh, helps us uh, to decrease the risk of all kinds of situations like depression and anxiety and so on. So this is uh, very important, okay? Do exercise, it's good for you. It will make you feel good. Um, okay, we're staying with the motor system. And now I want to talk a little bit about what is called proprioception, proprioception. 
Proprioception is uh, the sensory information that our brains get from muscles and tendons and joints. And this information is important for the brain in order to know where the body is in space and for the brain to be able to control our muscles. Actually, when people lose their proprioception, it's very rare, but there are people that have lost their proprioception abilities because of all kinds of rare diseases. The moment you lose your proprioception, in a way, your brain loses the body. Your brain doesn't know where your body is spatially and therefore it can't operate it. It can't uh, control your muscles. So um, this, this uh, information is very important for our ability to control our muscles. But I want to talk about proprioception in the, in the context of social cognition, our ability to read social cues, uh, such as understanding emotional facial expressions, uh, bodily posture, and so on, all these cues that help us learn how other people feel and adjust our responses accordingly. And I want to talk to you about a group of theories called simulation theories. These are theories in psychology and in neuroscience. And these uh, theories state that our ability to understand someone else, to understand his emotional state stems from the fact that when we uh, look at someone in an emotional state, we simulate his emotional state on our body. The body sends proprioception information to the brain and this helps the brain understand how the other person is feeling. So in a way, uh, we understand other people only through bodily, only through our own personal bodily experiences and this is why uh, even unconsciously we are always imitating one another we don't notice it in many times because it's automatic and it's very subtle but when we are around other people and they make facial expressions in many times we will imitate them according to simulation theories this will help us understand their mental state and their emotional state and here I want to show you an interesting study from 2016 that actually showed that when we are unable to simulate other people, we are unable to understand them socially and emotionally. And this study was done on Parkinson's uh, patients. Um, so people that have Parkinson, as you know, one of the major symptoms of Parkinson is loss of control of the muscles. And part of these muscles are the facial muscles. So at some stage of the illness, people are uh, unable to control their facial muscles. They are unable to create emotional expressions. Uh, and the researchers here wanted to ask whether they would also not be as good as recognizing emotional um, expressions in other people. And again, this is related to simulation theory because the researchers say, if you are unable to imitate people's emotional expressions, then you are unable to simulate them. And then your brain doesn't get the information that it needs to understand what is happening to the other person. So they gave them a task, which is called face morphing. So you see a face and this face starts with a natural, a neutral expression, and it slowly morphs into an emotional expression. And you have to recognize as fast as you can, what is this emotional expression? Is the face morphing into a happy face, uh, sad face, angry face, and so on and so forth. Um, they had, of course, a control group of people that didn't have Parkinson's. And indeed, they showed that the Parkinson's patients were not as good as recognizing emotional expressions as uh, the healthy control group. And also, of course, they were unable to imitate the expression. And this was a study that really showed the importance of simulation. Now, I bring Parkinson here because if you think about it, most people, when we talk about Parkinson, most people think about motor difficulties. What they don't realize is that people with Parkinson's also suffer from social difficulties and emotional physical difficulties. And again, this stresses the importance of the connections between the brain and the body. Once you are unable to control your muscles, when you're una once you're unable to control your body, 
once uh, your uh, proprioception is not as good, this will not only influence you, your, your ability to walk from place to place, it will, this will influence your ability to interact socially, to interact emotionally. And this is a big problem for um, Parkinson's patients, which needs to be addressed. So, so it's not only a motor dysfunction, it's also social and emotional um, dysfunction. And again, the body here is really, really uh, important. Okay, the next thing I want to sort of shi shine a light on is this thing that I called uh, interoception. And I will say again, interoception is the sensory information flowing from our internal organs into our brain. So this is sensory information from the lungs, from the heart, from uh, the, um, the stomach, uh, from the intense intestines, uh, from our bladder, uh, from our blood vessels, okay, any, every internal organ that you can think about. And again, <laughs> of course, this information is very important for the body's ability to regulate internal processes. Uh, and it is important for us to know, for example, when we have to go to the toilet and when we are hungry because our stomach starts to sort of contract and when we've had enough to eat because we feel pressure in our stomach. And if it's difficult to breathe, we can feel the pressure in the lungs and so on. So, so this is important information for our day-to-day -day functions, but also crucial information for our emotional awareness. And here, again, I will shine the light on interoception and emotions, and we will ask, what can my body tell me about what I am feeling when I'm confront confronted with an emotional um, experience? And again, oops. Okay. And again, we're going to do a little exercise. I have four pictures. And I'm going to show you to them. I'm going to show you the, these pictures for about 10 or 15 seconds. And I want you to try, not to try, I want you to notice what is happening in your body as you are watching these pictures. And again, feel free to write in the chat. Okay, so four pictures, which I have carefully selected for you. And I want you to, to notice what is happening in your body as you are looking at these pictures, and what does this mean? What does this tell you about what you are feeling as you are watching these pictures, okay? So if you are ready, I'm gonna go to the first picture. And here it is, one of my favorites. If you look at it, I'll take a drink of water. And I'm inviting you to write in the chat, what are you feeling in your body at the moment? And what is this feeling telling you? <clears throat> so Emma is writing disgust. A lot of you are writing disgust. Now disgust is also is already the name that you are giving to the experience. How do you know that you are feeling disgust? Yeah, so people are writing now. Uh, tight in my throat, so my throat is closing, sinking in my stomach, queasy, someone is writing, I looked away, so this was a bit overwhelming, feelings like I should gag, so something here coming up, uh, and of course, this picture is supposed to create disgust, uh, and to show us that disgust is a bodily feeling, okay, again, disgust is the name or the interpretation that we are giving to our stomach cringing and our throat closing up and the feeling of, oh, I'm about to gag, okay? So I'm gonna let you off the hook and I'm gonna go on to the next uh, picture. And again, if you can write, what do you feel in your body when you look at this picture? And how do you interpret this feeling? What is the name that you give to it? So people are writing chill, thrill, exciting, fun. I'm smiling, butterflies, holding my breath, heart rate increased. I can't handle it. I'm with you. I also can't handle it. Tense, 
laughed, fun, euphoria. So this is a good picture because it shows the differences between us. Uh, for some people, this picture is very pleasant. It, 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 it uh, creates pleasant bodily sensations because people look at this and say, wow, bungee jumping, that's fun, that's exciting, I really like to do it. If you are like me, you have the complete opposite experience. I have a major fear of heights and there is no amount of money you can pay me to make me go bungee jumping. And when I look at this picture, my stomach sinks and I start to shake and I look at it and I say, why do people torture themselves like this voluntarily? Um, and again, sometimes it can feel the same in the body. So I'm looking at this and my stomach is cringing and someone else will look at this and his stomach will also be cringing, but I will experience it as fear and he will experience it as excitement and fun. Okay, so this is interesting and it's all in the body. Okay, next image. So people are writing, ouch, hurt. It's a very good picture, by the way, because it captures the moment. Um, my neck, eyes are squinting, sourness, squinting, elation and dejection simultaneously. It depends who you're more uh, identifying with, the one that's kicking or the one that's being kicked in the face. Um, my head immediately pulled away like protective tight shoulders so again this picture mostly will cause us some sort of unpleasantness uh, in the body maybe some of us really can feel the pain in the area of the neck uh, and of the shoulders i will talk about pain soon and why pain is important for our ability to understand other people and we're getting on uh, to the last picture and we'll finish on a positive note. I always finish on a good picture. So you can look at it for a few seconds and write how you feel when you look at this bunny baby. So people are writing laughter, smile, warm, happiness. Again, happiness is already an interpretation of something happening in the body, relaxed. My chest relaxed. Yeah, a lot of people talk about some sort of sensation of the chest expanding. I guess a lot of you, you wrote, you smiled, maybe you laughed, so something in the facial expression. Indeed. Good. Okay, so thank you for your uh, cooperation and participation. And this takes me again to a very interesting study that was published in 2014 which looked at, a, at exactly the same question that I was asking you here, which is when I'm confront, confronted with an emotional stimulus, what is my body telling me? What happens in my body? And what is the name that I give to, this, um, to these processes happening? And actually what these researchers try to do is to create bodily maps of emotion. So to take all kinds of emotions that we are feeling as human beings and see how these emotions are expressed um, in the body. So they took a group of about 800 uh, participants, which is quite a big group for a, a psychology, psychology experiment. And they exposed them to emotional uh, stimuli and they asked them, they used an application and they asked them to mark on a silhouette of a body uh, where is the feeling in the body when I'm exposed to this emotional uh, stimulus, where is the feeling in the body? And you have here sort of a heat map when it goes up to the areas of the yellow and the red, it means a strong sensation. And when you go to the areas of the green and the blue, it means uh, the sensations are going down. And these are the maps that they were able to create. And you see here 14 emotions, some of them very basic, some of them more complex emotions. So you can see here anger, fear, disgust, happiness, contempt, depression, love, anxiety, and so on. And I'm showing you these bodily maps again to stress um, 
uh, the, the wealth of information flowing from our body to our brain. Okay, and when I look at these maps, I'm thinking to myself, you know, are we really paying enough attention to our body in emotional situations? Can we use our body more to understand ourselves better, to notice what is happening to us inside of, a, of an emotional um, experience? And this is really interesting. This study is, is, I think it's open access. So you can look it up in Google and you can read the, the full study and you can look at this image and compare between the different maps and, and look at some of the emotions that are really similar and some of the emotions that are uh, really different. So if you look at, at anger and fear, they look a little bit similar, but they're not completely similar. Um, if you look at depression, depression is experienced as uh, no sensations in the body. The body sort of becomes detached and unfeeling, which is interesting because actually people suffering from depression, that's what they talk about. They say, when I'm depressed, it's not that I feel bad. I just don't feel anything. I feel completely disconnected from myself, from reality, from other people. Um, so this is very interesting. If you look at shame, shame is one of my favorites because it looks a little bit like the Spider-Man mask, but it's because when people feel shame, they blush. And so there is uh, a lot of sensation in the cheek area. And so that's why the cheeks are sort of painted, uh, painted yellow. When you look at happiness, you can see that happiness is something that sort of flows throughout your whole body. So, so this is really fascinating. I do encourage you to go and look at the, at the study and read it. And again, I'm, I'm showing this study as a way to, again, uh, stress that we need to listen to the body because the body is always telling us things about how we feel. And when we know better how we feel, then we are better able, of course, to, um, to regulate ourselves. Um, now, I want to talk also about the connection between interoception and our ability to feel empathy. And this goes back to simulation theories. We know today that one of the basic mechanisms helping us uh, feel empathy is being able to simulate someone else's distress on our own bodies. And this has been studied mostly in regards to empathy for pain. And we know that when we look at someone undergoing a painful experience, our bodies will react as if we ourselves are experiencing this pain. So we will actually see processes in the body uh, showing activation of all kinds of pain receptors and so on. And the, and the pain areas in the brain will be activated. And this will help us um, empathize with the person standing in front of us. And this is why the expression, I feel your pain is really uh, exact from a neuroscience perspective, because we actually automatically feel other people's pain. Of course, this can be influenced by, by all kinds of factors. A factor, we don't always feel empathy for other people, but when we do feel empathy, uh, it's, it's because in, in many cases, we feel the pain ourselves. And I want to show you an interesting study, a little bit anecdotal, but an interesting study that has shown that when people use a common pain medication, um, their empathic abilities go down. So what they did in this study, they, they took a group of completely healthy people and they asked them uh, to take uh, common painkillers for about two weeks. Um, the painkiller is um, acetaminophen or paracetamol. It's what's, what's found in Tylenol. Here in Israel, it's, it's called Acamol. In the USA, I think it's called Tylenol. So a really, you know, daily painkiller, which you can get in, in every pharmacy. You don't even need a doctor's note. So they gave these people Tylenol for about two weeks. And then they exposed them to stories about people suffering. And they showed them videos of people suffering. And these people uh, were asked to report about their empathy levels. And it was shown that these people had less empathy. Of course, they were compared to a control group. These people had less empathy. They also did uh, neuroimaging. They put them in the fMRI machine and they showed that their brain, their pain networks in the brain were less active. And again, 
that's why they were less able to empathize because their ability to simulate the pain of other people was um, impaired. Now, of course, this is not long lasting. Once you stop taking the Tylenol, everything goes back to normal. But again, this is an interesting study showing that once you are a little bit disconnected from your own body, from your own pain because of the painkiller, it makes you a little bit disconnected from other people's, um, other people's um, pain. So that's interesting. Um, I wanna say in relation to interoception and pain that one of the areas in the brain which have been researched is an area called the insula. The insula is actually a part of our cortex, but it's quite an ancient cortex. So evolutionarily, it's quite an ancient, ancient cortex. You can see it here. It's, it's, it's quite deep inside our uh, temporal lobe. And the insula is the area in the brain that gets interoception from inter internal organs and sends them onwards to other um, areas of the brain. So the insula here is quite... Uh, important and it is also part of our pain network so when we feel pain or when we look at someone else experiencing pain our insula will uh, get activated and this is one of the brain areas most connected to our ability to feel um, empathy okay so uh we're getting close to the finish and the, the message I was trying to give you here in this short talk is I can talk about brain-body connection for a whole year, of course. This is just uh, to give you a taste. But the message I was trying to give you is that our brain, mind, and body, our brains, minds, and bodies are deeply connected. I call this the holy trinity, okay? Body, brain, mind, <laughs> they are connected. And again, as I said in the beginning, these connections are bidirectional. So your body will, inf will influence your brain and your mind, and your brain will influence your body and your mind, and your mind will inf influence your body and your brain. And this means that when you are working to keep your body healthy, you're actually working to keep your brain and your mind healthy. And when you're working to keep your brain healthy, you're actually working to keep also your mind and your body healthy. Um, and this is good news because it means we have a lot of channels through which we can uh, cultivate our health and our well-being. Um, I think, unfortunately, our way of life has caused us a little bit of disconnect from the body. Uh, this is because we spend most of the day sitting down. Uh, we don't do enough uh, physical exercise we don't practice enough attention to the body and, and you know taking short breaks during the day to ask ourselves what is my body telling me that i need now what is my body trying to you know communicate uh, to me about my emotional state and so on and so forth and we need all of us to find ways to reconnect with our bodies and there are many ways to reconnect with our bodies so we have of course physical activity we have meditation exercises. Um, we have relaxation exercises. We can go for a walk on the beach. We can do guided uh, imagination. There are so many ways to sort of, you know, learn to stop and pay attention to the body. And we need to understand that we need to, we need to intentionally make time for nurturing our bodies and nurturing the connection between our body and brain and, uh, and mind. Um, and I will say a few words here about meditation because as I told you, I come from a center that studies mindfulness meditation. And to say that uh, from all the things that I told you, you should be able to understand that the body is what I call an emotional and attentional anchor. We can use the body to learn about our emotional state, but we can also use the body to regulate our emotional state, to regulate our attention when our mind starts wandering and when we start getting lost in all kinds of stressful thoughts and so on. Uh, the body is always with us. The body is always present in the here and the now. 
And this means that whenever our attention starts to wander or whenever our stress levels start to go up, whenever we feel we are going out of balance emotionally, we can use all kinds of bodily exercises to regulate ourselves, to bring our attention back to what is happening to us right now, to be more uh, present. And this is the major power of meditation. Meditation teaches you to work with your body as an anchor to be in the here and now and mostly it does it through breathing exercises breathing is so important and there are a lot of studies being published these days about the power of breathing so we know that people that do breathing exercises on a regular uh, basis uh, activate areas in the brain related to emotional regulation and body bodily awareness like the amygdala the insula that I mentioned, the prefrontal cortex, which is a very important area for emotional regulation and attention regulation. And regarding stress, we know that exercises from the family of what is called paced breathing, I will explain shortly what it is, but paced breathing, these are exercises that activate the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is the branch of the nervous system that helps us to uh, regulate uh, stress and uh, become grounded when we feel that we're getting out of sync with ourselves. Uh, paced breathing exercises are exercises in which you pace your breathing on a regular in, on a regular tempo. So I think the most famous exercise of paced breathing is called four, seven, eight. And in this exercise, you inhale to the count of four you hold your breath to the count of seven and you exhale to the count of eight. And studies have been shown that once your exhale is longer than your inhale and there is a break in the middle, this activates the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. And so today people, um, it is recommended for people to do these exercises two, three times a day. It doesn't take long. You can do it for three, four minutes three, four times a day. And in the long run, this helps you uh, regulate uh, stress better. Okay, so, so breathing is a very important place for us to go back to when we are stressed, when we are unregulated. And again, the, the benefit of breathing is that the breath is always with us. We can always use it. Uh, two words about clinical implication. Of course, if we understand the importance of the body, to the function of the brain and to the function of the mind, then we can use the body in clinical settings of therapy. Um, so we see today a lot of forms of therapy based around using the body, connecting with the body, learning to pay attention to the body. Um, starting from um, clinical psychologists incorporating mindfulness breathing exercises into their uh, therapy sessions, of course, uh, art therapy, which works on the senses, of course, physical therapy, which is about the body. Uh, we also have today therapeutic dance groups, therapeutic running groups, and these things are amazing and they help people through reconnecting them uh, to the body. Just excuse me for one second. Just one second. Sorry, I have a cat here that needs to get an antibiotic pill. So I'm giving instructions to my husband uh, how to do it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, so bringing the body into, into psychological treatment is so important. And therapists, of course, know this. They don't need neuroscience to tell them this. I think therapists intuitively understand the importance of the body um, during therapy. Uh, also, this understanding is precipitating into the medical world. So you can see today a lot of psychiatrists which are pre treating people that have depression and anxiety and they will tell them, I will give you a medication, but uh, in parallel to the medication, you need to start doing physical exercise. You need to start walking, you need to start running, swimming, 
uh, whatever makes you happy, but incorporate exercise as part of your psychiatric uh, treatment. And the results are amazing. I can tell you from studies that I've been reading that in many cases, most studies are about depression and anxiety. In many cases, when people incorporate aerobic exercise into their daily lives, the levels of depression go down, the levels of anxiety go down, the dosing of their medication goes down to the minimal dose, which is also, which is always, you know, something um, that we want to achieve. And I talked, I mentioned briefly the gut microbiota. Today, there are so many studies trying to understand how we can influence the gut microbiota to get our brains to work better. Now, this research is in its infancy. We can't say anything yet about this, but I believe that in so many years, as we progress with this research and as we understand better the connections between the gut and the brain, there will be a lot of therapies based on diets for people. And this also can be uh, wonderful. Um, so these things have implications, not only to our daily lives, but of course, also in the clinical setting. Um, and this is it for me. I want to thank you for listening. Uh, it's not easy to listen to a talking head uh, on Zoom. Um, if you want to contact me, you have here my email and you have the link to our, um, to our website. We are also on Facebook and YouTube, but in Hebrew. So if any of you people do speak Hebrew, you're welcome to look for us on Facebook and YouTube. Look for Merkaz Sagol Lemoach Vetoda. Merkaz Sagol Lemoach Vetoda. And you will find uh, a lot of podcasts and lectures and videos and all kinds of other interesting stuff. Uh, so, okay, I'm gonna stop the share so I can see you all better. And we have about uh, 10 minutes. Um, so if you have questions, comments, thoughts, you are most welcome to share them. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I think I have collected some questions that, that were in the chat throughout the talk. Would you like me to help moderate and start to have people ask the questions from there? Yes, that would help me greatly. Okay. May I amazing. say something? I, I, of I'm 83, and when you say old at 60 and 65, it bothers me. <laughs> so older, let's say. <laughs> Thank you. El elderly people. <laughs> I, I'm not, but thanks. <laughs> but, but again, if you think about this, why, why, why does it bother us, this word, this word old? Old doesn't, but the, the elderly. I'm on the Senior Center uh, Commission for my city. And, you mm -hmm. know, we study a lot of age-friendly issues. And mm -hmm. I realize there are exceptions, but still, it's just the label of what is a senior you know, and what age it is, um, yeah. been researching on that. And it just pings my heart a little when I hear 60 and 65 being old. And uh, we are living longer, you know, as a society. Yeah. And I'd love so, today. So I meant, I, I meant the older population, just to show that the study was done not on 20 year old or 30 years old, because this, this researcher specifically focuses on people 60 and up, Again, because he looks at these interventions as a way to uh, lower the risk of developing dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, because when I talk about physical exercise, most people say, you know, physical exercise is for young people. I'm too old for this. And, and I'm trying to sort of change this concept uh, and help people. Well, I do it, it all. Mindfulness. Right. Gonna... Exercise. <laughs> so that's great to hear. That's great to hear. Totally. I'm going to jump in with our first question. I think we had a couple people asking, it's a super quick question, Dr. Alvada, about um, aerobic exercise, the, the duration and the frequency. So I wonder if you can share what you've seen in the literature about to help answer people's questions in that sense. Yes. Yeah, so, so mostly today, the recommendation is three to four times a week between 45 minutes and an hour you need to get to a state where your pulse goes up. Yeah, so if you go out for a walk, it's not a stroll in the park. You need to walk quickly and you need to feel your heartbeat go up. But as I said, moderate, you don't have to go crazy because doing too much aerobic exercise is stressful for the body. So three, four times a week, 45 minutes to an hour, 
aerobic um, exercise, so walking, swimming, cycling, running. I also, again, I do want to stress that stretching and flexibility is also very important, but it has other effects. When we talk about uh, memory conservation effects, the aerobic exercise uh, has the strongest uh, impact. Amazing, yeah, so helpful. Um, yes. I'm going to start asking around to people if they want to ask the questions. Ari, are you here? Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop you for um, a second because pe people again are asking me for my email. So I'm, I'm going to write it now in the chat. Okay. So for any of you wanting to contact me, my email will be in the chat. That's it. Sorry. Yeah. Amazing. And we'll also share, um, everyone just so you know, sometimes it's annoying to copy from Zoom. So we'll share Noah's email as well with the takeaways after this amazing, amazing talk. Yeah. Noam, I can actually send you the presentation. I don't mind. You can send the PowerPoint presentation to people. Is that, can you do that? Do you have people's uh, contact information? I mean, it sounds uh, like a dream, Noah. Thank you so much. This is really, you said, are there any questions? Yes, a million and a half, but that's why I'm muting myself, so. Yeah. So Ari's question was about the deactivation versus um, activation, how and how it shows on a PCAP. Do, do you want to share? Which question was that? I, I'm not sure I understand. I can ask it for him. I don't know if he's still here. Um, I see he's muted and his comes off. So how come all the deactivation seems to reside in the limbs and the activation seems to reside in the thorax? Yeah, and so those, that's an interesting question. Yeah, he's, he's talking about the research with the emotional uh, body maps. It's interesting, I, I guess, because again, when we talk about uh, pro, um, interoception, it's mostly from internal organs and most of our inter internal org organs are situated in our sort of the middle of our body, the thorax. So that might be the, the explanation. And, and I guess we are more sen sensitive to information coming like from the stomach and from the gut and, and from the chest. Maybe pay little less attention to what's happening in our arms and our legs. I know that when I'm stressed or excited, it goes straight to my stomach. That's the first place where I feel. Yeah, and I think that's too many of us. And we saw that in our responses in the chat too. Um, yeah. So thank you for the answer. Next, I think maybe we have time for a couple more. Andrew, do you want to ask one of your two questions that you shared? Sure. Um, so I was wondering if you know about any other research uh, about brain body connections for other sensory modalities. Um, mostly I was wondering like, um, as you age, you might have more hearing impairment and how that might affect cognition. So that's an interesting question, and I can share with you that I'm also hearing impaired. You can't see it, but I'm wearing uh, hearing aids. I, I lost my hearing about a year ago in an unexpected and unexplained uh, uh, way. Uh, and actually, I have to say that I don't know the research in this area. I mean, again, from my personal experience, and this is not scientific research, this is only my personal experience, I can tell you that when it first happened to me like the first few months and even today sometimes i do experience uh, moments in which i feel sort of disconnected from my body and from the world and, and today it happens less but in the first few months it was it was quite strong and a very unpleasant feeling so so i i, I feel it on myself um and you know what, your question uh, makes me want to go and look at the research and see, see what they say about it. So thank you for that. I'll, I'll, I'll go and check. And, and if I find out stuff, I'll send to Noam and Noam can forward it to you. <laughs> or you can email me uh, directly, uh, Andrew. Great. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So next we had a question from um, Rochu. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Is was the bodily maps of emotion based on heat maps? And if so, does that mean our bodies are colder when they're depressed? Yeah, so when I talked about heat maps, I didn't mean actual heat maps of feeling hot and cold. Heat maps is, is just a concept to, to, you know, to show where places have more or less sensation. So it wasn't related to bodily temperature just to where people sort of uh, wrote on the silhouette that here the, the feelings go up and here the feelings uh, go down. 
So it, it didn't have anything to do with temperature. Uh, there was a question that I, I wanted to, to clarify because someone asked, uh, what is the distinction that I make between the brain and the mind? And this is an important distinction. Um, so I will say, again, this is, this is my definition. First of all, mind is something that is really hard to define. Uh, and there are many arguments among neuroscientists and psychologists and philosophers. What is this thing that we call mind? So I will give you my definition. When I talk about the brain, I talk about the biological processes, okay? So the neurons, the synapses, the neurotransmitters, the, the operation of the biological tissue. When I talk about the mind, I talk about all the mental processes that are created because of the action of the brain. So when I talk about the mind, I talk about our thoughts, our feelings, um, our sense of self, um, our memories, uh, our inner world, our inner being. Okay, so, so this is the distinction that I make between the, the brain and the mind. So the brain is the biology and the mind is more the psychology. But again, mind is something really hard to define. I mean, we all know we have a mind, but it's very difficult for us to explain exactly like if an alien would come and ask us, what is this thing you call mind? It would be quite hard to explain, I think. And of course, as a neuroscientist, I am under the assumption that the mind is uh, created by the brain. So this is what we call a monistic view and not a dualistic view that says that the mind and the brain are two separate uh, things and that the mind can go on to exist even without a brain. So the scientific view today is a monistic view. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Alvada. This has been so amazing. Um, I really, really, I think we all really appreciate just all of the knowledge that you've shared with us and how you're able to translate it in such an accessible way and also for sharing your story and being vulnerable with us. Um, just wanna thank you so much for being here and um, we're already getting so much great feedback. So it's exciting. I just wanna share, with our, with everybody here in our community um, that you can find us on Instagram where we have amazing, beautiful content that you can follow along with and learn more about the brain. Um, and yeah, with that, we have takeaways coming that'll be coming um, in your emails if you receive those. You all are all on this, so you'll receive that. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to the staff. Do you have any other? <laughs> I want to thank you again for listening. This was a very good experience for me. And thank you, Noam, and thank you, Sarah, and the whole Synapse uh, team for inviting me. And I'd be happy to return if you would like. We'd love to have you. We're going to keep you to that. <laughs> for sure. Already saying yes. <laughs> once the, once, especially once the gut microbiome research is a little more. Happily. Amazing. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Hope you have a great rest of your day today and get outside and get some walking and some sunshine. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. This was beautiful. Bye, guys. Also, Bye. happy Easter, happy Passover, happy Ramadan, yeah. whatever yeah. you're yeah. celebrating. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Unbelievable. Thank you. Bye bye.